From Microbe TV, this is Immune, episode number 16, recorded on January 15th, 2019. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast about the body's defenders against disease. Joining me today from Ithaca, New York, Cindy Leifer. Good afternoon. Welcome back. Happy New Year. You too. First immune of 2019. Yep. And from Durham, North Carolina, Steph Langle. Hey now. Can you sense that I'm in a different place? Do I sound different? Sounds better. <laughs> well, good. Maybe the connection is, or the room. If you hadn't corrected your location on the show notes, I probably still would have said Worcester, Ohio. <laughs> I know. I was but, anticipating uh, that. Dur- Durham is easier, I have to say. It's, but, it's, but you have to say Dr. Langle. Oh. That sounds more educated, right? Do I sound? Yes. <laughs> so uh, are we enjoying Durham? Yes. I Well, I arrived uh, two Saturdays ago. I started last Monday and I living in Raleigh and commuting to Durham and I am loving it. Uh, the group I'm in, the Institute I'm in within Duke. Yeah. I'm really, really liking it. I'm, I'm definitely optimistic and motivated and ready to work. What's the size of your lab? It's pretty big and growing. Um, yeah, gosh, we had a lab meeting and maybe there's like 20 people. Wow. Big. Yeah, yeah. I think, but that's including everyone from rotating MD PhDs, rotating PhDs, postdocs, staff. So, mm. yeah. But it's it's a it's a great group and a lot of energy and excitement. So it's a I think it's a really good fit for me. Have you started pipetting yet? Oh yes, started pipetting. We have experiments planned. I'm we're gonna be I'm gonna be doing mouse work for the first time. So I have a lot of training with that. So very different well, than pigs. Easier than pigs, I guess. Uh, yeah, it's it's easy. Well, not really to find veins for bleeding, I, I guess. But <laughs> Are you going to miss pigs? I, right now, I can tell you confidently, I, I think I will be okay without working with pigs yeah. for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> My daughter's a big uh, pig fan. Her room is full of pig, plushy pigs of every kind. You can imagine whenever I see a pig really? picture, I send. Yeah, she loves pigs. I'll have to. Is she interested? And in, maybe I'll. I have so many pig things people have given me. Maybe I'll send her something. She would love it. Yeah, she started, you know, with piglet as a young child, and then still, oh. and she still has this little piglet hand puppet that she still to this day keeps with her all the time. It's really. Oh. I'm afraid if she lost it, she would freak out. But she loves <laughs> pigs. And she always wanted a, a, a tiny micro pig, right? Well, so, oh, yeah. I said, no, 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 no pigs yeah. in the house. And you have to make sure uh, with those because a lot of people think they're buying micro pigs, but they're actually just small for their age, pot belly, or, you know, larger yeah, pigs. Yeah. They're 600 pounds. <laughs> and then you get a big pig one day. It's like people <laughs> who buy alligators and <laughs> they get huge. All right. So before we do our paper, it's my turn this uh, month. I want to tell you to stay tuned for a giveaway of a book. We're going to do the first book giveaway here on Immune. I think we didn't do this before, but we do it. I don't think we did. Do it on our other podcast. I get lots of books passing through and uh, brand new. And I'd like. Are you going to tell us what it is yet, or we have to stay? You have to stay tuned, and uh, Uh, anticipation will kill me. (laughs) That uh, you'll have to, you know, listen. (laughs) It may. It could be in the middle. It could be at the end. Might have already done it. You better go back and listen again. <laughs> but we'll tell you what book it is and uh, how to get it. Great. But today is all about chickens. <laughs> I don't think we've talked about chickens yet. So. You know, we've talked about mice and pigs a lot because Steph used to work on pigs. Uh, what other animals have we talked about on immune? Lamprey. Lamprey, yeah. Lampreys. Uh, of course, there are a lot of other experimental animals we, we talked about. Talked camelid about. antibodies, camels, yeah, yep. camelids, and today chickens, which most people will think of what they eat, eggs or chicken meat, but they're a great experimental animal, it turns out. And the paper I picked um, is uh, it's kind of, I cheat when I pick papers for immune because um, there's always a virus involved, so I have some comfort I can back onto the virus. <laughs> <laughs> so I will fully admit that I cheat. No, this is a great paper. Cool. I really liked it. And also it touches upon some veterinary virology 
um, we're going to, you know, having it be a agriculturally important species. So touches upon a bunch of different areas. And of course, both of you will be able to weigh in heavily. So the paper is published in PNAS uh, last fall, that's November, unraveling the role of B cells in the pathogenesis of an oncogenic avian herpes virus. And it comes from, so the, the first author is Luca Bertzbach and Maria Laparidou, Hartley Etches, Caspers, Schusser, and Kaufer. From yep, a, I know Ben. You know oh, Ben Kaufer? I have Ben Kaufer, yeah. So Ben is at the Freie Fre Fre Universität of Berlin. Yeah. And other people are the Technische Universität München, the Ludwig Maximilians Universität München, and Ligand Pharmaceuticals in San Diego. I like that name, <laughs> Ligand Pharmaceuticals. So as you can see by the title, it's all about B cells, and it's all about a virus, a avian uh, herpes virus. And the cool thing here is the use of knockout chickens. And chickens, mm -hmm. as I said, they've been important for research. I didn't realize some of these things. B, B cells were first recognized in chickens. That's right. Yeah. <sighs> Amazing. There's the <laughs> antibody producing cells. And they're named after the bursa of Fabricius. Yeah. It says a gut associated lymphoid tissue required for B cell development. Graft versus host was first described in chickens. First attenuated vaccine made by Louis Pasteur <laughs> against <laughs> Val Cholera. And today's paper is about a herpes virus that is very important, uh, agriculturally extremely important. It's called Marek's disease herpes virus, named after Josef Marek, a Hungarian veterinarian who first described it many years ago. Would you all ever want a virus <laughs> named after you? <laughs> Not me. Too long. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But Marek, Marek is good. Lifer virus would work. Lifer virus. <laughs> Langle, sure. What, you, you wouldn't mind having a, how about an organ, you know, the bursa of Fabricius. Oh, right. <laughs> right. I don't know. That one's in the cloaca. You know where the cloaca is? Yeah, that's the in butt, the right? That's the butt. Yeah, butt. yeah. Right there. <laughs> so you wouldn't, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't want that. Um, that. That was also named after Hieronymus Fabricius. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Dis wow. discovered the bursa of Fabricius in 1621, and it's named after him. And Hieronymus, I, I remember Hi Hieronymus Bosch, who was a yes Flemish All painter. Crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. Painting. Yeah, crazy stuff. Um, so this paper um is all about Marek's virus in chickens, and this is a really important. Uh, virus because if you have, you know, people grow chickens in huge numbers and they can get lots of infections of all sorts. You can get avian influenza, you can get Marek's disease, which can cause a number of issues in your children and your chickens. Oh, not your not children. Not your children. <laughs> not your children. <laughs> <laughs> infect your children. Although some people probably think they're chickens or their children. Are their children. Yeah, or pets. True. Backyard flocks, yeah, yeah. But it will cause, among other things, um, a cancer. And so, um, we, we vaccinate, we, I don't mean we, because I don't own any chickens, but um, uh, chicken farmers vaccinate uh, to prevent infection. Um, this is an interesting, you know, go, ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, do you know how many chickens they house in like a chicken house when they're, they have a poultry farm? No, I, like I one don't. of the big producers? Nope. Do you know? You have a guess? In like so, one, one, I know, so I don't, I don't want to say. I'll let it <laughs> no, I, I have seen pictures, you know, where it looks like it goes on for acres of chicken. It's like more than a hundred thousand. Hundred thousand chickens. You can have, you can have a couple hundred thousand chickens per house and a couple houses per poultry producer. Yeah. Right. I mean, and there are so, right. There's, I think the estimates in the U.S. There's a we have nine billion chickens in the U.S. And then yeah, you break that down, there can be hundreds of thousands in a flock and they can break that down between, they usually do between different buildings and their growing stages, you know, because if you have this many chickens, you have to be able to auto, you know, automate some things. And so separating them out by age is one way mm. they do that. That's right. So, Cindy, so you wrote there 22 billion, 22 billion doses of vaccine of Marek's disease mm. virus vaccine given 
to commercial production chickens each year. And some of that is Cornell's vaccine, right? That's the cool thing. So I knew, so when I saw this paper, I was like, I know something about this because Merrick's disease uh, virus vaccine was created here at Cornell. So there were several different vaccines, but the one that was created here at Cornell is called the S from the SB1 strain. And that's the most commonly used Merrick's vaccine. Mm -hmm. uh, in the world. And it was, it was made by two individuals, Bruce Kalnick and Tone Shot. And Tone Shot is my friend. He's in <laughs> the, he's in the room next door in the, uh, in the, uh, the, um, office next door. He doesn't have a lab anymore. He's emerita, emeritus. Um, but, um, but he's also my neighbor, but he tells me the story. He's like, we would literally not be eating chicken with our, you know, at dinner, if it were not for this vaccine, mm. because this, wow. this, uh, this virus used to kill between 30% and a hundred percent of flock of a, uh, chickens in a flock. And now it's about one to 2% because of the vaccine. Mm. That's amazing. Mm. That's huge. And, yeah. you know, doing vaccine research in agriculturally important animals like chickens, especially chickens because of how cheap chicken is sold. I mean, you, your vaccine has to be able to be easily deliverable and effective. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times developing vaccines, I mean, it's pennies on the dollar that producers right. are willing to spend just because of the production costs and how, you know, how cheap chicken is. And, you know, in the end, some people have opinions about that, but I just think we do have safe and affordable food because of these practices and they can always be improved across the board. But veterinary virology and immunology and vaccinology really contribute to us eating healthy, cheap food. Yeah, all, all chickens are basically vaccinated. Yeah. On not. the whole planet otherwise. And if you're... Chicken farm gets infected. You have to shut it down until you know you're cleared because you right, can't yep. you can't have this virus. And I I learned that the vaccine is actually injected into eggs. Yeah, that's <laughs> cool, isn't it? In ovo vaccination, which is great because you know handling chicks would be pretty labor intensive, and the egg inoculation could be automated because we already know we can automate injection of eggs for the production of flu vaccine. Mm -hmm. so it's mm -hmm. probably just a derivative process. Yep. And uh, the the chicks uh, get get immune. Now the interesting thing about this vaccine, we covered this on a TWIV some time ago. It doesn't prevent infection. It's, it doesn't induce what we call sterilizing immunity. Mm -hmm. The virus can still infect chicks. They don't get sick, but it infects. It replicates. It can transmit. And there is some thought that this has selected for more virulent mm -hmm. strains of the virus because. There's no check on, there's a check on disease, but not transmission. Hmm. We, we're a little skeptical about that in, uh, in our TWIV, but it turns out now that a lot of the strains that are circulating globally are more virulent than they used to be. Hmm. And that coincides right. with usage of the vaccine. So most of the vaccines we use in humans are sterilizing, prevent mm -hmm. replication. Uh, but this is one that does not. So it still works, but it's a concern. Right. And get, it doesn't I, because this is a is a DNA virus, right? Because it in, integrates. Well, is that part of the reason I think, why. No, I think that it's, it's not just sterilizing. Some, I I don't think so because it's a chronic it, infection. You know, if let's say you have a DNA, it, it doesn't integrate. It, it remains episomal in the nucleus, mm. but oh, okay. you know it's latent, which means it's not exp, it's not expressed at certain times. And then if it's expressed, if you have antibodies, they should neutralize virus. So that shouldn't be an issue. There's something about the nature of the immune response to this vaccine that doesn't prevent. It doesn't block infection, you know. Hmm. And I mean, I, I think they could probably develop one that did, but since this is used and it works, right? Uh, right. People, I guess, aren't willing to do it. And I'm wondering if it has to do, I mean, with the immune system of, I mean, they do they vaccinate a day 18 of a 21 day um, hat, hatch site, so they're going to hatch after 21 days, and then it's two weeks after the immunity is developed. So those animals are young, and there may be a component to their immune system that does not allow them to fully inactivate the virus. Um, maybe if they were given to older chickens, but by that point they would have already gotten it. So mm -hmm. maybe it's mm -hmm. to do with. You know, young maybe. immunity. Yeah, maybe. Hmm. So Merrick's disease um, is a collection of symptoms. You can have immunosuppression, paralysis, edema of the brain. Uh, if you've seen photos of chickens with uh, Merrick's disease, they're kind of sad. They look. It is sad. You know, they're yeah, really yeah. they're really messed up. 
And um, so, but the one that we're going to talk about mostly today is T cell lymphomas, which are fatal. Yes. The most prevalent clinically diagnosed cancer in the animal kingdom. Hmm. It's amazing. And this is the first basically anti-cancer vaccine, right? I believe it was, yeah. We talk we talk about HPV in humans, but this really was a long time ago. This Mm -hmm. was in the 70s, right? Yep. And this uh, this can be 100% lethal. Yep. And the vaccines uh, are really good at preventing lethality and and, uh, allow, as uh, as Cindy said, allow us to be eating chickens, or maybe it was Steph. Otherwise, we wouldn't be eating chickens. Sure, sure. Without this, yeah. without this. So how is it spread? It this It's acquired by the chickens by inhalation from the dust, and, you know, those big chicken areas are very dusty. Um, and the, the virus gets into the lung. Um, macrophages and DCs are infected. The virus then is transferred to lymphoid tissues. That's This is the model that was accepted before this paper was done. And then the idea is the virus is passed on to B cells, which are the main target for productive replication. Eventually, the virus makes it to T cells, and there they become latent, and of course, um, they can cause T cell lymphomas. Interestingly, the way this virus, you're right, Cindy, I'm sorry, this does integrate into telomeres mm-hmm. of the yes. genome. Yes, yep, yeah. Very few herpes viruses do that, and before this, I looked into this. The only one I knew about were the HHV6. That's it's a right, human yeah. herpes virus, which will go into telomeres. Most of the others remain meposomal. But this one also goes into the telomere, and that's the model of latency, of course. Yeah. Um, these uh, T cells bring the virus to feather follicle epithelia. Hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and that's where it's shed, and that's where and it gets out of the chicken and into another chicken. So that's the the idea of how this works. Um, the virus transforms T cells, uh, leading to this lymphoma. They make the virus makes a chemokine, which is a, a ortholog of a chicken chemokine that recruits B cells, uh, which is just so cool. I mean, the virus <laughs> yeah. evolved to produce an ortholog of a chemokine. Yeah, and I and ILA we talked about it in the last episode about neutrophils. It's really well known as a neutrophil chemotactic factor to bring those target cells of primary neutrophils, Mm -hmm. but other Mm -hmm. granulocytes as well to uh, sites of infection. So that, when I read that, that was very cool. So it Mm -hmm. attracts the cells that it will then infect and establish Mm -hmm. latency and transformation and so forth. So that's, that's um, generally the, um, the virus and the disease. Now what they're looking at in this, um, in this paper, is the role of B cells. So for years, people have tried to figure out what's the role of B cells, are they really critical or not? And all the experimental approaches that people used didn't really give unequivocal answers. So for example, they tried uh, depleting B cells chemically by exoradiation, by removing the bursa, which is where the B cells develop. But every time this was done in different labs, they got different results. Right. Sometimes replication decreased, sometimes it increased, sometimes there was no effect. So there was no conclusive answer on uh, the role of B cells in this and like, infection. And likely do, because of those methods, yeah. probably had some off-target effects or did not fully remove the B cells. Yeah, exactly. And that's a problem in agricultural species. We don't usually have all the tools that mice do that's right. to have a reductive right. approach. That's right. And that brings us to transgenic knockout chickens. Hmm. And that's what they use in this paper. And everyone knows probably that we can make transgenic mice and some other animals as well. can also make um, transgenic chickens. And I have a paper here from 2013 where they made the first knockout uh, in chickens. And that's what was used uh, in this paper. So they want to knock out B cells. And the way they do that is very clever. (laughs) You don't have to cut out the bursa or anything like that or give them chemicals. You just have to disrupt immunoglobulin production because in order for B cells to survive, they have to have uh, immunoglobulin Membrane expression, immunoglobulins on the membrane of them, or else they die. Therefore, if you knock out 
immunoglobulin expression, you can knock out the B cells. And so that's what they did uh, in the chicken. Um, and the way they do this in chicken is slightly different from uh, the way they do it in, um, say, mice. In mice, one way to do it is to use embryonic stem cells. You could, say, disrupt the gene in embryonic stem cells. Nowadays, you would probably use CRISPR, but mm -hmm. in the old days, we used homologous recombination methods to do that. And then you can take those embryonic stem cells and implant them into uh, an egg, a fertilized egg, and put it into a pseudo-pregnant mouse, and it would give rise to uh, offspring that carried either the disruption or if you put in a transgene. But you can't do that in chicken because, the, because chicken embryonic stem cells um, do not contribute. They're not germline competent. But instead, there are what are called embryo-derived primordial germ cells. They can be cultured. They can be DNA can be introduced in them. They could be cloned, and they can be reintroduced into the chick embryo. They colonize the gonad and give rise to fully transgenic progeny in the next generation. Mm. So you take these chick primordial germ cells. You can make a knockout, you could put a transgene in if you want, and all you have to do is inject them into the embryo and they'll give rise to transgenic chickens. So in the 2013 paper, that's what they did, and they disrupted uh, a part of the heavy chain gene, the segment called the JH segment. Maybe, Cindy, you could tell us what that is. Well, so um, that the antibodies are made up of heavy chains and light chains, and so the heavy chains have a, a different components that get moved together in mm -hmm. the genome, and the intervening sequences are chopped out, and so J is a part of the heavy chain there. Right. Um, and so you need two two copies of heavy chain protein and two copies of light chain protein to come together to form the the canonical Y-shaped antibody. And so they knock out the, the JH segment, and that prevents yep. antibody formation. So the B cells don't have any antibody on the surface, and they die. And that's so how you- I know something cool about yeah. chickens? Yep. They, so <laughs> we, always teach, we always teach immunology. We have IgG, IgM, IgD, IgA, and IgE. And we always talk about what the different, you know, different mm -hmm, types mm -hmm. of immunoglobulins have different sort of functional profiles. And chickens have IgY. Right. You know, we just, we did a paper on, oh, I can't remember what podcast, but it was on zebrafish and they have I, mm -hmm. IgZ. Z, right? Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and there's another one also, another letter. X. Um, what was it? Amphibians have IgX. X. I looked this up. And yeah, other, cart so. cartilaginous fish have IgW. Yes. It's cool. Yeah. Very cool. So these are, they, they knocked out the JH sequence so they don't make heavy change. They don't make B cells. They lack like mature peripheral B cells. They do have the right. progenitors in the bursa, Right. Right. But they they get to the point where they're supposed to make a membrane immunoglobulin, and they don't, so they die. Yep, it's a, it's part of the selection process to make sure that when you're making a B cell, you make something that's functional. Mm -hmm. So the the there's a testing <clears throat> process to make sure that the B cells have made a functional immunoglobulin and express it on the surface, and make sure it signals with a temporary signaling chain. As long as it's fully formed and you know structurally sound, and it signals, then the B cell gets a survival signal and, and it goes on to do its thing. Yeah, and I think we talked about, I don't remember what episode, we did talk about negative and positive selection, central tolerance, which what we're touching on now, I can't remember which one, but if you go back, we did go a little more in depth with that if you're interested. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for the T-cells. Mm -hmm. So this group, the the Marix paper, took those chickens that had been made in back in 2013, and they said, let's infect them with Marix and see what happens. So... That's uh, that's the end of the immunology, almost, because <laughs> the rest is virus infection. But it's still very yeah, you interesting. You really did cheat, right? <laughs> I do. I did cheat. He, he hooked us in at the beginning. But it's it's still, uh, people can learn about sure. bursas and B cells and how, what you need to do to make. If you want to do this in mice, Cindy, make B cell deficient mice, you do it a different way, right? Mm, no, thing? it's pretty similar. You knock out... Um, Parts of the pathway that are required to make the immunoglobulin genes. Mm -hmm. 
So you, you knock out a, a, ch- a segment. So you basically, again, don't get Ig on the surface of B cells, and they die. Yeah. So it's a little bit. So there's also another cool thing about chickens. If you want one little tiny other detail, is that of most of the um, the way that mammals make antibodies is this idea of you just chop out the intervening sequences and you fuse these segments together to make a functional receptor. Mm -hmm. But in chickens, they actually use gene conversion. So once they pop out sequences, they also remodel the locus using gene conversion to, to swap out parts of the gene to make the specific uh, specificities in, in isotypes. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit different. Um, molecular mechanism by which they create the diversity of the antibody repertoire. Mm. Neat. It's cool. So there's more than one way to solve the same problem, mm. which I think is fascinating. And I also wanted to mention that we, of course, do not have bursas of Fabricius. No. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> Our B cells mature in the bone marrow. Yeah, um, but that makes it easy for students to remember, right? So they always remember B cells, bone marrow, T yeah, cells, yeah. thymus. Right. And I'm like, well, B cells is actually bursa. Like, bursa. What's bursa. But now that I'm at a vet school, they all know what that is. So <laughs> I also learned that um, this uh, identification of the bursa as the site of uh, B cell development was done by Bruce Glick, Max Cooper, and Robert Good. And there's yeah. Max Cooper again. Yes. When we talked about those lamprey antibodies, mm-hmm. that, that was his work as well. Yeah. The VLRs. Cool. Yep. 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 All right, so back to the paper. They take these chickens, they take, um, and they make sure that they don't, uh, they genotype them, make sure they're the knockout animals, right? Because you could, you don't want to do a lot of experiments and not use the right animals because they all look the same. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So they take one day old, uh, either wild type or uh, knockout chickens, and they infect them intra abdominally with a virulent Marix disease virus strain. And by the way, I did say Marix disease virus is a herpes virus. It's a uh, alpha herpes virus, which means it's in the same group of viruses along with herpes simplex, one, two, and three, three being varicella zoster virus. Its genome is about 180,000 base pairs of double-stranded DNA. So they inject these uh, chickens and they show they don't make antibodies in the blood, as you would guess, because they not they're not making mature B cells, and in fact, they don't. No IgM antibodies in the knockout animals, uh, and no B cells in the spleen by staining. So, after inoculation, they're not making uh, a B cells or antibody response. And what about virus replication? They look at the viral genome by PCR in just blood. Take some blood out of the chickens, do some PCR to amplify the genome. And they found that whether or not you had B cells, the virus replicated just as well, at least in terms of virus in the blood, which is really probably shocking to them because the dogma was that B cells are essential, right? Right. But if you look at the graphs, um, they all look pretty good. You know, the error bars are big. So these wild type, and they have a heterozygous and homozygous null chickens. And uh, they, in terms of virus production, they all look pretty much the same. Right. So B cells are not needed for at least this little initial amplification. Um, and disease, that Marix disease, all these different signs, disease incidence looks just the same as in the wild type mice. No difference in mm, chickens. Chickens in tumor incidence or anything else associated with uh, Marix disease. So wonderful, fully negative figure in PNAS. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is a negative important result. Important nonetheless. Isn't it? it is. Yeah, it's important. It's just saying it. Nothing definitely. Different. No, this shows that B cells are not important. Um, right. Although, so it is a negative result. But I don't have a problem because uh, I, oh. I like negative results. But I've had trouble my whole career publishing some negative results. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's a couple things about this paper that I was surprised that PNAS. I mean, I'm not surprised because there's a lot of novel things in here. But firstly, it's a veterinary pathogen, which in my experience has been difficult to publish in journals that typically mm. publish human pathogens. But there's, uh, of course, the the, no- the novel knockout chicken. And then, you know, negative results. I just think in all, I was really happy to see this published. It's nice. You don't see this often. Well, I want to point out that this uh, was edited by Bernard Reutzman. Yep. 
who is a huge herpes virologist, mm-hmm. has spent most of his career working on human herpes viruses, but most likely appreciates the importance, right? Definitely, yeah. Because you're st- and you're studying the progression of disease in the host that it evolved in, which we don't study in you know mouse models of human disease, for instance. Mm-hmm. So we can learn a lot from that. Yeah. Um, so the B cells are not needed for the initial infection. They're not needed for disease. They're not needed for tumor formation. And I, I should add the dissemination of tumors. Right. So where you find them in the birds, same distribution. Um, as you see in the wild type chickens, it's really quite clear. Mm-hmm. What about transmission to another chicken? Does this affect it? So they take these, they're infected animals and they house them with naive chickens, contact chickens, and uh, they show that the virus can spread to the other chickens. So B cells in the lung are not important for early infection and for transmission as well, because they can be transmitted from those B-cell lacking infected birds. So transmission, they say, um, nat- they call this natural infection. Mm-hmm. So I guess that's as close as you can get. I would say this is probably in a nice clean cage in a lab. I was going to say they're not going to let you do this in an animal facility, <laughs> like out, out in the, in the know, yeah, in the wild. You might imagine that maybe you know maybe right. when there's dirt on the floor, it's a different story. I don't know. Sure, be, yeah. But here in the lab, um, it it can be transmitted as well. I think it's a difficult virus to work with too, because it is a cell associated virus, and so the infection is cell cell. And so even in the feather follicle epithelium, they have to shed chunks of cells that are Mm. infected and they have to Mm. breathe in those chunks of cells. So there's no, there's not free virus. Right. Right. So next, um, how does it spread? How does the virus spread to lymphoid organs without P cells? Because maybe that is different. So they look at virus load in the major lymphoid organs without and with B cells, different times after infection, and they're looking at the bursa, they're looking at the thymus, uh, they're looking at the spleen, and there's no difference in the timing of arrival of virus at these sites. So I I looked at this, and I thought, and they mention it too, there there is a delay, Mm -hmm. but it catches Mm -hmm. up. So you wonder in the the wild type animal whether the B cells are a major mechanism to to move the virus to those um, immune organs, but that when there are no B cells, there are other cells that pick up the slack. So it'd be interesting to yeah. look at what percentage of the T cells in a wild type are moving the virus to to those organs because mm-hmm. it may, mm-hmm. may actually be a very small contribution. So it's hard yeah, to say. Yeah, it could be when you have the B cells there, they they do the brunt, right? But yeah, so they're doing something in a, in a in a wild type chicken, right? Yeah. Right, right. But you could take them out, and, and still you still get the same disease, at least in a lab. Yep. Now in nature, if you had a whole hundred thousand uh, B cell negative chickens out there. <laughs> Who knows what would happen? I think you'd have a whole lot of other problems, other issues. <laughs> you know, they would they probably start die. getting all kinds of infections. Yeah, I'm sure. But I mean, this is as close as you can get. Yeah. But look, this virus is replicating in B cells, right? Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's it's not there for nothing. <laughs> There's got to be something to it. Yeah, in the lab you don't need them. I think that's quite clear. But I'm sure they're doing something uh, in in the chickens in the wild. And I guess these are, uh, I don't know, these are certain kinds of chickens. I'm not I'm not familiar with chicken genetics. I don't know how much that plays into this. There are well, a couple yeah. different kinds of chickens. There's actually a lot of different kinds of chickens. But they're no inbred chickens, right? Well, I think so. Well, they I mean, the lines are so, yes, they kind of are, you're right. I mean, they're more... Uh, their uh, responses are going to be have more variation, like let's say mice, but they mm, have specific yeah. chicken lines that are bred heavily for production. And so th- they are not, they're not inbred, but I mean, they, they're very similar because mm-hmm. of that reason. Right? But they're also, as far as I understand, talking to my friend Tone, there's, there is a very specific way that they breed these lines to make sure that they maintain 
a certain level of heterogeneity so you don't get the issues that happen when you have fully inbred lines. Mm -hmm. So they have these inbred lines, but then they crossbreed them. So they have founder li- they have founders and then they breed those founders and, and keep lying. I, it's it's kind of complicated. He drew stuff out for me. But well, then they go back and they go to another line so that they're not always you know, inbreeding so heavily that they mm-hmm. end up with problems, but they do, they do, they are very, very selective about the breeders for both what are called broiler chickens, which are the chickens that we eat on the table and layers, which are the right. ones mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. lay like eggs. And so they, they breed them specifically, the broilers, they breed for very large breasts and um, they, mm-hmm. they only raise them to a certain age because they're so meaty that they they have trouble standing up after a while and then um the the layers are a completely different physique and and their biology is Mm -hmm. slightly different so that they're better at laying eggs and so we don't know which they used here yeah it doesn't say no I, I think for for this kind of thing, they use the broiler type. I don't actually. I don't. I don't really know. I, I shouldn't say that. I'm not really sure. They may have specific ones that are for um, experimental stuff. That's also, you know, that's a huge concern when you think about when you do things to production animals. Yeah, sure, sure. Like treating with antibiotics or things because those can get in the meat or whatever part that you're eating the egg and can be taken by the human and they can sometimes have effects so all that has to be studied and it i mean for transgenic animals you know there's no transgenic animal that we eat that's fda approved but we have the technology where we could knock out i mean in pigs there's a really uh pervasive and economically important virus called pers and they they have knocked out the receptor on macrophages to that virus but and i i mean having family that raise pigs, they would kill to be able to have a line of those. But well, one, they're too expensive, but I just don't think we'll ever get to a point where, you know, socially people would eat a transgenic Mm. animal, even though Mm. breeding wise, we're so far from where they were, of course, originally. But so I think, so Cindy, you're right. There is a delay. So B cells are doing something Mm -hmm. obviously, right? Whether and, and the, they still get disease and everything in this model, so you don't need B cells for that. But maybe in nature, you know, when conditions are different, maybe it makes a difference, right? Well, and there and there's justification. There is, you know, the previous studies that did show that B cells do something. It still gives yeah. that credit. The last experiment they did was um, what cell types are infected, because you could imagine that it might differ if you don't have B cells. So they do immunohistochemistry to look for infected cells. This is seven days after infection, and they have their wild type and their B cell lacking chickens. So with B cells, the virus mostly infects B cells in the spleen at seven days Mm post-infection. In the absence of B cells, the virus nearly always infects T cells, CD4 and CD8 positive T cells in the spleen. No B cells, of course, because there aren't any there. So it totally changes the, the the kinds of cells that are infected because there are no more B cells present. So T, T cells become the predominant infection site in the absence of B cells. And also in the thymus and the bursa, the same thing. Now in that bursa, of course, in the null chickens, there are very few immature B cells that are infected, actually, because we said they're immature B cells in the bursa of these null mice, but they don't they don't leave because they die beforehand because uh, they don't have antibody on their surface, and and very few of those they find are infection are infected. Um, so for some reason, maybe it has to do with the maturation of the the B cells. They're not permissive for virus infection. That's kind of interesting. That would be interesting to see. Yeah, that would. What is it that yeah. uh, different in the immature cells that the virus cannot replicate in them? Right. So these T cells, of course, are the target cells for latency and transformation. The virus becomes latent in the T cells. It integrates into the telomeres and persists in a chicken for its whole life. Can't get rid of it. Uh, And also can transform them and cause the cancers. So without B cells, you you get, uh, apparently, I think the way to look at it, it goes, in, in the presence of B cells, the virus infects them, probably gets amplified, then gets into T cells, 
without B cells, the virus is like, okay, I'll just go to the T cell. <laughs> but um, I just wonder if that has any different effect in a, um, I don't know, a natural situation outside of the laboratory. But right. I think in terms of the pathogenesis of infection, uh, you don't need B cells. Right. So I did cheat, but um, we're infecting the your immune cells. So that's... Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> There's always a context of disease. <laughs> so okay. what did we learn? We learned we can make chickens without B cells. And of course, for other studies, that's going to be useful as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and these these chickens will support the replication of Marek's disease virus. It causes the same kind of disease. It causes tumors, replicates in T cells. Um, and so the B cells, at least in this system, don't have a big role in uh, establishing infect infection. So I think something like this is going to be really important, um, developing this model a little bit more extensively than it has been previously and using the knockouts to understand really important human pathogens like the the high pathogenicity avian influenza. Mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, that'd be mm -hmm. cool. You can also use it to say, if we have an antibody we want to test, you can give that to the chickens in the absence of the chickens making their own antibodies if you wanted to do that. Right. Absolutely. Right. Now, they talk a little bit in the discussion about other cells that the virus replicates in, at least in vitro, mm -hmm. macrophages and phagocytes in vitro, but they didn't find that here. Hmm. Um, so apparently in the chicken, even in the absence of B cells, it's not replicating in those in those cell types. Or it's it's in a few of them, but they're... They didn't see them, yeah. Yeah, they didn't see them because they're only a, a very small representation of the population in spleen or, or the bursa. Mm -hmm. So the last sentence of the paper, uh, these data, they pioneer the use of knockout technology to study infectious disease in chickens, and they unequivocally refute the current dogma of the crucial role of B cells in Marek's disease pathogenesis and refocus future studies onto other target cells infected by the virus. Mm -hmm. T cells. Oh. Jesus, right, yeah. T cells. What? How does it transform? What does it do exactly? Would be interesting to look at. So mm -hmm. I would agree that it refutes the crucial role, but maybe they're still doing something of interest. Right. Mm -hmm. anyway, so there you go, Marek's disease. I remember hearing of Marek's disease as a graduate student ages ago. <laughs> I think this is the first paper we ever did on a podcast about it. I think you're right, Steph. We kind of ignore chickens. Well, I mean, I. <laughs> seemingly sometimes I think we are just, you know, obviously human centric because we're humans and we're mouse centric because we use those to study human diseases. But there's a lot of great science um, in veterinary related pathogens. So it's nice. We talked about it. I'm glad. Also, other animals are interesting when yes, we've been broadening in TWIV to viruses of insects and plants and plants, fish. Yep. By the way, speaking of vaccinating chickens, you know, there are a lot of fish uh, viral pathogens, and they have to. A lot of fisheries uh, immunize fish against some of them, and they mm -hmm. have to take each little fish and p take it out of the the tank and in, inject it with a needle and uh, put Is it back in. Yeah, I remember hearing that, but I, that's wild. That seems. Simple. I thought for some of them they can bathe them in it if yeah, it is oral, replicating, right. like a mucosal. Mm. Maybe. Hmm. The ones I've seen, uh, uh, they, they're pulling them out, and they have this gun, right? Huh. Psh, 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 and I guess you could get really good and do 100 an hour. <laughs> <It's> still, oh, <laughs> but 100 an hour. How many do they do for this Innovo? <laughs> you, uh, you had 25,000 an hour. An hour. <laughs> they need an automated fish vaccination machine. Yeah, they do. They do. But I think soaking them in would be great. Right? Yeah. yeah. Or make... Yeah, let's see here. I'm looking at an article here. Injection vaccines, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There are three major modes for for vaccinating fish, oral, immersion, and injection. Mm -hmm. With oral, they can feed it to the fish. Hmm. And you can get them pretty young. That's interesting. Immersion. Um, yeah, you put them in the, in the water. They're immersed in water containing the diluted vaccine, absorbed in the skin and gills. And of course, there are lots of a antibody producing cells in the skin, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Immersion vaccination. 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> they, they have two methods, dip and bath. And dip, wow. they're put in <laughs> for 30 seconds, and bath, they're exposed for one to several hours. And they're very small, and I'm looking at this picture here. Um, the they're fisher, just little. Yeah, little, like an inch or two. Fry, they're called. <laughs> Fry, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> I love the names for young, the young. <laughs> so what was a, what is a young chicken? Um Actually, polt? chick. A young female oh. chicken. Oh has, yeah, you're right. It could be. It's chick. I think polt is turkey. But there's a yeah, name for a so. young, a young female chicken. Let me look it up because I was going to use it in the title. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think. Yeah, you're right. Polt is is turkey. A so pullet. Must be- a pullet is a female about to lay pullet. eggs. A pullet. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I need the, to harken back to my animal science classes where we learned all. And this. then there's a a, a roaster. <laughs> <laughs> a chicken yes. four to six pounds over 12 to 14 weeks old. I'm not, I don't know if I'm going to eat chicken anymore. I feel badly. <laughs> All right, let's do some uh, emails here. Um, the first from Peter. Dear immune team, listening to BBC Radio 5 last week, I heard mention of a rare immune system reaction that I was previously unaware of, the abscopal effect. This is a reaction where localized high-dose radiotherapy is given to a cancer patient and results not only in remission at the radiotherapy site, but also at metastatic sites throughout the body, sometimes resulting in complete remission. This has been known about since the 1950s, but only recently has much progress been made in understanding the effect. The abscopal effect has been much more frequently observed since the introduction of the immune checkpoint blocking antibodies which I will not try to pronounce. Ipilimumab and pembrolizumab. <laughs> I think you mentioned abscopal and in, in when you talked about the Nobel Prizes, uh, Cindy. It's possible, yeah. I think the abscopal effect would be an interesting topic for discussion, and Peter gives us some links. Uh, yeah, we, we actually, I, I encountered abscopal for the first time last year. We're starting to work on viral oncotherapy. Mm-hmm. Huh. Right. And some of these have abscopal effects, distal to the tumor. So what is exactly what, is the definition of abscopal? You know? It is an effect away from whatever it is that you're treating. So if you inject a virus into a tumor, mm-hmm. the tumor regresses, but also metastases will regress that are distal to that site uh-huh. because there's obviously an uh, immune activation and other things right. going on of some sort. So it could be an interesting topic, yeah. I, I would be interested because I looked up some of this stuff and, and a lot of this has to do with when you cause damage to the primary tumor, you're releasing these, we've talked about this before, these danger mm-hmm, patterns. Mm-hmm. And so that's part of how you can now recognize the tumor because those danger molecules are released also with tumor antigens. And so then you can, what we call break tolerance and generate an anti-tumor effect that would be effective both on the primary tumor and the the, um, the metastases. And so those are going to trigger through the receptors that I love, which are TLRs. <laughs> so I think that that would be fun. That would be, yeah, that would be good. All right. Well, there's some papers you might consider. Steph, can you take the next one? Yes. Yes. Is this a meal? Yeah. Yes. This is okay. Let me see where to start. Okay. Dear immune host, I hope this finds you well and that you're enjoying the transition to spring. Are we enjoying the transition to spring? I no. don't think it's no. spring. Uh, there's snow on the Must, ground out here. Maybe We're there's a, a di- storm maybe, this weekend. Is, it, is this that old or is uh, it I a different? I don't, I don't know. Maybe. This, maybe <laughs> I'm hoping it's not that old. Poor meal. I don't know. Um, <laughs> with the, uh, This is a bit long, so I'll <laughs> try to go fast. With the event of smartphones, I discovered the availability of podcasts and stumbled across the offerings of micro TV, which I enjoy and have taken up the daunting challenge of delving through your years of archival material. For TWIV, that is quite a lot. Up to mid-January of this year, my interest in catching up on some of the latest advances in microbiology was based on curiosity, an interest I've always maintained for the subject. Uh, He studied and worked as a microbiologist in the 80s and 90s, but left that aspect in his career in in 2000. However, now it has become a personal priority to re-educate myself, especially with the respect to the immune system, because out of the blue, with no prior issue or family history, and being healthy and physically active, I was suddenly hit with a bout of severe ulcer of pancolitis. He lost 20 pounds, about 20% of his body weight. Oh, sorry, 30 pounds, 20% of his body weight. That's a lot. And had my life turned upside down, seven plus weeks of bloody diarrhea, 24-7, it's pretty much rendered me housebound. That is just, that's terrible. Anyway, with the events 
of immune, especially three, four, and five. I feel like I hit a jackpot of clearly presented and thoughtful discussion on topics that now have relevance to my personal situation. And if you're curious, three, four, and five, three, we talked about um, the dengue virus vaccine and bispecific monoclonals. Uh, Four was the immunotherapy, CAR T cells, and five was food allergies. So as I understand the cause of colitis is not known, it does seem to be diet related, but may be triggered by an infection or a parasite, or it may involve an inappropriate inflammation response to constitute, um, cons- constituents of the normal microbiome. At the time my testing was done, all results for possible causes were negative. Mm. In order to suppress the inflammatory response in the colon and hopefully achieve remission, begum infusions and infliximab, an uh, TNF alpha inhibitor, which is the chimeric human murine IgG, the binding epitope for TNF alpha being murine origin. Three weeks into therapy, I believe I'm beginning to see some improvement. Fingers crossed. Right. That is great. It's humbling to be in a position to benefit from all the research and development that has come together so far to help provide viable treatments for this condition. Regarding costs of this treatment, which we do talk, we have talked about before, although I have not seen actual numbers, I've read each infusion costs upwards of 4000 I did not look up CD. I think it's Canadian dollars. It's Canadian. Okay. The dosing involves an infusion of, rem- of the infliximab at zero, two, and six weeks, then every eight weeks thereafter. Apparently, there is a they, there are biosimilar or subsequent entry biologics, such as Inflextra, that are available at a reduced cost. Um, a discussion of overall costs and options for these therapies um, at between different federal and state levels and in different countries might be interesting. In any event, here patients prescribed this monoclonal are registered into a patient support program. And in his case, coverage is first from work benefits, which covers 80%, and then the balance is covered through the healthcare system and, and patient support. So I'm assuming because this is Canadian specific that that would not happen in the U.S., um, not. probably not. We are assigned a coordinator who takes care of all insurance and cost aspects of the treatment. And even if I were to lose my coverage from work, they'd be able to provide additional coverage required. And the, so in the end, there's no direct cost to the patient, wow. Needless, which is, yeah, that's definitely not happening in the U S needless to say, I have no plans to ever leave the boundaries of this healthcare system. <laughs> I would not either, <laughs> uh, of any coverage of the normal Intestine versus Crohn's, colitis, IBS, or similar autoimmune diseases, TNF inhibitors, or alternative therapies and underlying immune responses will be most welcome. Thank you for taking the time and effort to bring this production to fruition. And that is a really well-written and um, interesting explanation of a personal situation. And I can imagine just very frustrating, which is for a lot of patients with this disease because you don't know what the initial cause of is. And we've, we have talked about before what the different possibilities are, but there's not one cause and it's genetically predispositioned um, as well. So Vincent, I know that you had mentioned somebody in your life had also experienced issues like this. Yeah. Our our younger son has IBS, right? Inflammatory bowel syndrome. And, but he's not taking anything. It's, it's intermittent. And right. We're, I think this seems I, I like think a very acute situation. Yeah, I mean, his is probably diet induced, and he's been pretty good at being able to identify what things trigger. Mm-hmm. Right. So he's got a pretty restricted diet now. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, he's, <laughs> I should say, he's home now for college. And they come down in the morning. I could tell what he's eating the night before because it's all out on the table. Nobody <laughs> never puts anything away. Right. <laughs> um, so that doesn't change. <laughs> That no, no. Hey, how it's going to change? It doesn't change. It's I. <laughs> I said to my wife, "Why can't he put things away?" She said, "Why do you think things are different from when he was five years old now?" <laughs> but my daughter's the same way. But um, these monoclonals uh, and uh, other in- these aren't. I, I guess these are MABs. These are monoclonals. Yes, yeah. they were making some inroads. I was somewhere once at a company, and someone was complaining about their IBS, and, the, and someone in the company said, "I have a monoclonal for you." <laughs> so I'm sure we'll cover this uh, in future episodes. I honestly yeah. think that you could have an entire podcast devoted to like uh, Crohn's yeah, for sure. and I. Yes, there's so much research yeah. on that those particular diseases, and and they are different. Some are autoimmune, some are not, and uh, just all the different therapies. And I think the point that he makes that he's in uh, humbled by 
the ability to benefit from all of the science that came before. And I think that's what keeps all of us doing what we're doing is, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, yeah. here, thank you, Emil, for saying this, because it, it reminds us how important our work is, right? Um, and that why we're here is not to just have fun in the lab, but to benefit humanity. And so right, to right. hear a personal story where you can connect and say, I see how the research in immunology benefited me directly. I, it's, 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 it makes my day. Oh, yeah, I agree. We had a, we, um, Emily, if you're interested, we had a recent TWIV where we discussed in mice evidence that neurotropic flaviviruses, that is, you know, Zika, West Nile-like viruses that infect neurons, can cause intestinal dysmotility syndrome, which huh. is what you're talking about. Yeah. And so these are systemic infections, but they, they reduce uh, gut transit time. They cause inflammations. So, you know, for for acute uh, cases like yours, infections with some of these viruses are clearly um, potential triggers anyway. Hmm. So that's TWIV 527. It's called City Mouse, Country Mouse. Oh, that's right. I, I saw that one. That was a great title. Okay. What are, now I lost my um, thing. We were at Cindy, can you take the next? Name. Probably two because this one is first sure. one short. So Christine is really short. So Christine writes, uh, there was a slightly unclear explanation in the intro of episode five. Go figure. You know, <laughs> we're not... Not perfect. We've talked about that. No, before. and that one was mine. I went back because I love PIGR. I love IGA. And so this, yeah, I go for it, Cindy. But I maybe I said something a little unclear and I apologize. Yeah, it says uh, PIGR or pig R transports dimeric IGA, not monomeric IGA. The pig R gets cleaved and remains as the secretory component on secretory dimeric IGA. The J chain that conveys dimer formation of IgA is already synthesized in the IgA secreting plasma cell. Right, right. So I'm not I'm not sure what exactly you said, but I think well, I am you assuming nicely clarified what we said. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So I think probably maybe I misinterpreted where that J chain was, and if I just said IgA, it was I just in my head I'm always thinking dimeric or you know, not monomeric IgA, but yeah, so that the plasma cell that's in mucosal compartments and secreting dimeric IgA, the J chain is already on that dimeric IgA and polymeric immunoglobulin receptor on the basal side of epithelial cells is what picks up that J chain to transport it to the other side. So I believe that this is Christian Wobis who ah, okay. put a really excellent review on the role of PIGR and secretory immunoglobulins during mucosal infection. So I'll highlight that because I it was I really enjoyed it. Um, I'll put post that in the show notes. So I think it's near and dear to her heart. I'm assuming that's why she wrote us an email. Well, that's great. I, I, I so we have individuals like Emil who has his own personal um, diseases where he's talked to us about this, and then we clearly have people who are are knowing more about the immunological topics that we're talking about. Yes, directing yes. us. So this is everyone great. can write in for sure. <laughs> So should we do one more? One more. Yeah, Cindy, go okay. ahead. Okay. Francois Xavier. Did I say that right? You're yeah. better at these names than I am. Okay. Oh. So he writes, uh, Dear Immune Team, I'm a, I'm a listener of your podcast, Twim and Immune. Following your podcast number seven from the 18th of April, please find here under a brief description of a neuroborreliosis inducing Alzheimer's idea model. So that was so your I, your episode on that was on compliment. compliment. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I don't. I'm not sure. Is this his own idea? I because I wonder if he wants to give this away or work on it. Because it's very <laughs> interesting. Neuro so, Borreliosis, of course, is Lyme disease, right? Right. Okay. Exactly. So Lyme. So he says the ideal or, idea or model to consider is one: neuroborreliosis activates the amyloid precursor protein and toll-like receptor 2, or TLR2. Second point he makes is, is APP, or amyloid precursor protein, activation increases C1Q from the complement system, and we talked about C1Q in that episode. Three, that C1Q activates microglia. Four, TLR2 activates microglia. And then five, Borrelia 
which is the um, active agent for Borreliosis or Lyme disease, deactivates the C3B pathway via factor H protein, then stops the MAC system or the membrane attack complex, the complement complex. It's a very interesting article with very good diagrams. So the summary is that neuroborreliosis triggers activation of the early complement pathway in micro and microglia, but Borrelia blocks the second part of the complement system via deactivating the C3B. So no C4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So no MAC attack. And MAC attack's important for killing bacteria directly, of which Borrelia is a bacterium. So Borrelia triggers an innate immune overreaction, but blocks the end of the complement pathway for its own survival. And so um, he states a few different articles here to support each one of the points he's made and says, I stay at your disposal. (laughs) (laughs) But I think this is really interesting. And I, I don't, I don't know who you are, but if you uh, enjoy putting these kinds of puzzles together and you haven't considered graduate school, you should, because this is what we do. You know, we read a bunch Mm -hmm. of different papers um, and we pick little bits out of each paper and we kind of put the puzzle together into a bigger model and then we create ideas to test that model. And then that's what we do in our research, which is really fascinating. According to the email, uh, he is at... Felix, I don't know, P H E L I X. It looks like a company, London, Leicester, and Paris. Uh-huh. Okay, or so maybe, maybe he's already done all his. Who knows? But anyway, interesting. Goodness. So the idea would be that uh, Borrelia is somehow inducing Alzheimer's via the complement reactions right. that you discussed previously. Right. That could be, you know, we talked about herpes and uh, Alzheimer's over on TWIV. Some mm-hmm. interesting ideas there as well. All right, let's, let's end up with. Uh, some picks. Uh, Steph, what do you have? So there is a special on Netflix. It's called Seven Days Out. Have either of you seen this? Nope. No. Okay. So what <laughs> they did was they went to, I don't remember how many, basically big events and including the Westminster Dog Show, the Chanel uh, Couture Fashion Show, and the Cassini um Hey, let me see right here. I'm going to pull it up here so I can post it in. Um, and so basically the Cassini mission, which is NASA's uh, Cassini mission, seven days out before it it happened. And I just loved it. I loved I'm working through these because it's really fun. Every You just realize every interest, every industry field has its own world with drama and its own culture and to kind of get a peek into that. And it, some of them make you wonder like, wow, people take this so seriously, but to them, that is their science or, you know, their immunology obsession. So I, the, the Cassini one is most related to science. So I'm going to highlight that one, but the, all of them I'm going through are really good. So I recommend it. Hmm. Hmm. Cool. Interesting. Cindy, what do you have? So um, I picked it's it's two links, but it's a it's an idea. So there it's been floating around. It's been on the news and so forth. So there was a documentary about um, Watson uh, and his life and how James Watson, how he was uh, one of the discoverers of the structure of DNA and so forth. And uh, he's kind of a controversial figure. <laughs> he's a and, very controversial <laughs> figure. And and, uh, <laughs> and said quite a number of very um, unkind, very biased, racially um, heated types of things, both in his interview and previously. And the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, for which he used to direct, um, came out with a very, very aggressive statement saying they unequivocally reject the unsubstantiated and reckless personal opinions Dr. James Watson expressed on the subject of ethnicity and genetics during the PBS documentary, American Masters Decoding Watson, that aired on January 2nd, 2019, um, that his statements are reprehensible, unsupported by science, and no rep- no way represent the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories, its trustees, faculty, staff, or students, and they condemn the misuse of science to justify prejudice. And I pick this because I think in um, the the things that are happening in our culture and society right now, um, I 
there's a backlash to this kinds of behavior. You know, people have always said scientists are kind of quirky and just, you know, shrug it off. They say things, but these kinds of damaging things I think are, shouldn't be tolerated. And I applaud the Cold Spring Harbor to come out and say this. I know I have a personal experience um, that I won't go into too much detail, but when I was a graduate student, I saw Jim Watson um, speak very briefly, but during that time, he basically told everyone in the audience if they hadn't come from you now, these are all trainees in graduate school, not all, but a lot. Um, if you hadn't come from his lab or one of his pedigrees labs, um, you had no business being in science. And that um, it would be, if you went into science, you would be siphoning off the money that the good people who can do science should be using. Mm-hmm. And I was, I was shocked, offended, and had no idea how to take that when I was in graduate school. I'm like, did, did, did a Nobel laureate just tell me I shouldn't be in science? Mm. You know, it's, it was really, um, disparaging. And to know that he holds views where he thinks that people of certain ethnicity simply have a different intellect, innate intellectual potential. I, I, I just, um, I think it's awful. Um, I, I guess yeah. it's okay PBS did a documentary on this because there's no doubt his scientific discoveries are of great importance and groundbreaking. There's there's no doubt about that. But it, I think that we can't excuse behavior like that. We can't just shrug it off. Yeah, I, I have a very, like, firstly, I don't even really give Cold Spring Harbor as many props as... I mean, I understand that they came out, but I think it's actually a reaction to the very strong, aggressive response of particularly people using social media for science. And they could have come out. He, This is not the first time he said things like this. So, He's been I saying mean, these that, things for years and they still held yes. him. I mean, you know, they had, let him direct it. <laughs> Yeah, they let, I mean, and they, I don't exactly know all of the things they gave him, free housing, honorarium, all these things. I just, I I guess the question is at what point, because somebody has a Nobel Prize and obviously made a great discovery, potentially also stealing Rosalind Franklin's work. Ah, yeah, yeah, that's another issue. When, when is it, like, when can we cancel this dude? I I just think that there's a point where he is so, there's a point where somebody is so damaging where you have to sit, Cindy, your personal experience, or somebody who is not white skinned and think I shouldn't be in science. That is canceled. We are no longer accepting that narrative. And I just think he should, even that there's a PBS doc, like we get it. He's, he, we've seen enough about him. Like, let's move on to people who are not damaging young scientists. So that's my thought. (laughs) Yeah. I think you're both right. I think he, these are ridiculous things that he says, but, um, I don't think PBS should have given him a new forum. You know, they're just look, why, they're looking the, for eyeballs and controversy are, that gets are, them. Um, and that forced Cold Spring Harder to basically fire him, get rid of him. But, you know, he's now and he's, he's 90. He doesn't know what he's talking about anymore. And you basically put a, a person who is incoherent on national television and then you do. I think it's, it's just all bad. He's starting from him and what he's saying. That's horrible. It's uninformed. But I think right. PBS is also uh, kind of. Aren't there Plus other they, things? Aren't there other things you should, you could talk about? Why don't you yeah, talk about checkpoint therapy and abscopal yeah. effects? Much CRISPR. more. Oh my gosh! But this yeah, is but, what people dwell on. You know this celebrity stuff. And uh, but Cindy, I am glad you brought that up as a pick because I do think that it's we've just reached the point where it's time to, I mean, be done with him. <laughs> yep. I, what did you say? I, cancel, I know that cancel this dude. That's cancel, great. Cancel, cancel this dude. <laughs> and I know that that is not a favorable opinion. You know, maybe because I'm a younger trainee and I just, you know, there's a lot of people who think people should not, you know, have awards stripped away or they should not be demonized. But that's, I mean, you're holding on to some, I, I don't know what you're holding on to nostalgia, the reverence of awards. But it, at some point, I mean, it's a new day in science. It's time to move on. All right, you have to leave. Huh. You got a few more minutes, Steph. Yeah, I re- yeah, I got. All right, more. I'll just do a quick pick. My pick is an is an article in Nature. Cool subject. Mitochondrial DNA can be inherited from mm-hmm. fathers, not just mothers. Yeah, I saw that. And this is a, a little article you could probably get access to, which is based on a PNAS finding uh, of a rare instance when mod- mitochondrial DNA, which we've always thought is just maternally delivered, uh, is as opposed to nuclear DNA. 
In some cases, in some very rare cases, cases there can be a paternal contribution. And the reason this is interesting is because it made me think of why you wouldn't want paternal mitochondrial DNA to be transferred in the first place. It's often, there are some mitochondria in uh, sperm, but they're destroyed uh, after fertilization. So why would that be? And nobody really knows the answer. But one of the ideas is that you have this, you have a mitochondrial geno- genome and you have a nuclear genome. The nuclear genome can repair itself, but the mitochondrial genome cannot. So if it undergoes damage, uh, that could be a problem. And since sperm are swimming and they're doing making a lot of uh, oxidative reactions, it's more likely that the mitochondrial DNA are going to get damaged. So that's one theory about why you wouldn't want to transmit that damaged DNA. The other is that if you had two different sources of mitochondrial DNA, they might start competing with one another. So if you had a mutation in one that made it replicate quicker, that might predominate, even though it might mm, cause defects in, say, respiration, the pathway Mm. of energy generation. So it's a cool idea to get people thinking about uh, what's going on there. And my my second is... uh, (laughs) Is it website? I was looking for titles of this episode. I came across a website called Chicken Puns, which is part of Punpedia. Like thousands and thousands of ways to use chicken words and oh, puns. Wow. So if you, I didn't know I didn't know about Punpedia. And so if you think the title I of this episode isn't cool, it's because of Punpedia. <laughs> most likely. All right, that's immune sixteen. Uh, it, it's at uh, Apple Podcasts, Microbe TV slash immune. Send your questions and comments to Immune at Microbe TV. And I'd like to give away a copy of a book called Myeloid Cells in Health and Disease. This is a book published by ASM Press uh, in 2017. It's an edited book, so there are chapters uh, by different authors. And it's a huge book. It's uh, about four inches thick, and it covers all aspects of myeloid cells, infection, and repair of damaged tissues, secretory molecules, uh, atherosclerosis and other diseases, tumors, and cancers. It's a brand new book. I want to give it to an immune listener. How do you get it? Well, just send us an email, immune at microbe.tv with the subject line myeloid, and we'll pick one email out at random. I guess we're not eligible, huh? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you want this book, Cindy? <laughs> oh, I'll let somebody else have it. <laughs> I love myeloid cells. Immune at microbe.tv. Cindy Leifer's at Cornell University. She's on Twitter at Cindy Leifer. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you. Steph Langle is at Duke University. Stephanie Langle on Twitter. Thanks, Steph. Thanks. Nice to be back for the new year. I have to correct. I still had Ohio State down there. Mm-hmm. Oh, down there. So I didn't see that one. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Music on Immune is by Steve Neal, stevenealpercussion.com. Thanks for listening to Immune, the podcast that's infectious. We'll be back next month. <laughs> <laughs>